Good morning. Thank you for joining us this beautiful Memorial Day weekend. John chapter 15, verse 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And that's what we observe at Memorial Day, people who have given their life to preserve freedom in our country, freedom to practice faith, freedom uh, to be a democracy. And uh, we just honor people who have given their lives, and those who have served as well, but today specifically those who have given their lives in service to our country. So let me just say a quick prayer as we just reflect on that, which is a, which is a Christ-like thing, an act that reflects Jesus to be self-sacrificial in that way. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the chance, the opportunity to live in a place like this where we do have the freedom to gather and to worship your name. And Lord, I thank you for the many people who have given up and sacrificed in so many ways, but especially those who have sacrificed and paid the ultimate price in order to preserve those freedoms for us. Lord, I just pray for their families now. I pray that you would lift them up and that you would comfort them in this time. Lord, I pray for um, just, just our nation, that you, would, that you would reach people, Lord, through your church, that we would be uh, those who use the freedoms that, that we have well. Um, and God, that we would ultimately be glorifying you. God, I pray that we would, as a society, as a culture, honor those who, um, who are willing to take those sacrifices for other people. And you've taught us to do that. So we love you, Lord. We praise you when we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We started a series last week called I Have Good News. And it's, it's called this because we have been given and entrusted with, we were entrusted with good news to take to the nations, to take to the world, to take to people around us. You may be familiar with the little fable called Chicken Little. And um, this is a story about a little chicken who gets hit in the head by an acorn that fell out of a tree. And the chicken thinks, he looks around, sees nothing, because the acorn rolled away and is out of sight, and sees nothing around, so it, he concludes that the sky must be falling. And so in a panic, this chicken runs around the farm and convinces all its little animal friends that the sky is falling. They are beginning to believe this story. And then they approach the fox who tells them, yeah, I have a great place for you to hide away and be safe from the falling sky. And he leads them to his den. And they all go into the den, never to be heard from again. Now, depending on the children's version that you may have heard, it may have ended a little bit differently, but that's really the, the heart of the story. Here's the point. The irrational fear of something or thinking that everything is doomed can make us ineffective either by causing us to take extreme action or to do nothing at all. And we see that in our cultures, uh, people will, will name things, the chicken little syndrome, uh, and, and label them as such because people are panicking about something and it's causing one of these reactions. And um, here's what I think the reality is. This is the current state of the church as it relates to evangelism in America today. We have a little bit of chicken little syndrome <laughs> because as we look around, we're starting to see things change from our perspective. And we're thinking that the window is closing of, for people to be receptive to the good news that God has given us to share. Because we think people are less receptive, we're less willing to take the risk to speak about it. And when that happens, we either take extreme action and we do things that don't work, or we take no action and we keep ourselves quiet instead of speaking up and sharing with someone who needs to learn about Jesus Christ and what he's done for them. Matthew chapter 9 Verse 36, 37, 38, that's going to be our primary passage. We're really going to hang out there almost exclusively today. We'll jump to one other spot. But this is just such a powerful moment in the life and ministry of Jesus because of how it captures his emotional side and, his, and the way he called his followers as well in this chapter and what comes next as well. Um, he says, it says this in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, when he, Jesus, saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. This is just a powerful and central verse, I think, for the life of Jesus, for his ministry to the world. And what he, what he asks of us as his followers that first part of the verse says that Jesus saw the crowds. We're going to pull five things from this verse 
five realities that we can see here about Jesus' response and about Jesus' heart. And the first thing, when we simply look at that first phrase, when he saw the crowds, we start to see something with Jesus. And and really, the question that we're going to ask ourselves based on this is, do I see the lost? Do I see the lost? It starts with seeing. Uh, I'll tell you, every time I open the door and Mackenzie asked me to grab something from the pantry, um, I cannot find it. I think that it doesn't exist. And I'll be like, yeah, we're out. Don't have it. Sorry. She'll walk over and be like, it's right here and pull it right from in front of my face. In fact, I don't think I'm the only one. I don't think I'm the only one who has that reaction, right? You got my back? I, I, I witnessed it this morning, actually, so not from you, but I witnessed it earlier today from John Lee, who's running security today. I'm calling him out. I told him it was going to be an illustration. I didn't tell him it was going to be him, um, but now I'm changing it because it was me, but now it's him. So he, he was looking. He's like, where are the buckets that we put out? It seems like somebody must have taken them home. They're gone. They don't exist anymore. Uh, too bad. We've got to move on, find a new plan. And I walked up. I'm like, I think they're in this case right here. He's like, I looked. They're not anywhere. I walked up. I'm like, they're right here. He's like... John, is that you back there? True story. True story. It's okay. You're not alone. There's at least two others of us in this room right now who experience this. It's, it's something that happens to me all the time. We don't see. I, I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it. Sometimes it's because I don't know how to look. Sometimes it's because I'm not looking for it. Sometimes it's right in front of my face, and for whatever reason, I just don't see it. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is, do we see the loss? Now, let me just pause real quick, because this, even this, this way that I'm phrasing our points this morning, I don't want to get misinterpreted. When we talk about the lost, there can sort of feel like this implication of like, you're lost, I'm found, you're a mess, I've got it all together, and that is not what the Bible talks about when it talks about people who are lost, who are far from God. It's not saying that at all. It's not like as soon as, as soon as you're like into the found category, everything smooths out, you got your whole life together, you've learned it all, you got it all figured out, everyone should model everything after you. Like it's a process. It's a process. I'm, you know, when we get found, we're, we're being found. It's a process of being found and of submitting our lives to Jesus. But he does talk about a group of people who don't, who don't have a relationship with God and he refers to them as the lost simply because God wants them back. That's really what that should connote to us. It's not that, oh, we've got to figure it out, and they don't, but God wants them back. He wants people who are far from him. He wants them close to him. That's what it means to be lost. It's somebody who needs to become close with Jesus who's not there right now. And so the question is, when Jesus looks up and he looks at this crowd of people, he sees and he recognizes, and first thing he does is he, he notices. He's, a, he's um, aware. He's recognized the loss. And I think that's something that we need to make sure we're doing. Jesus continually saw people. He saw them. And he saw people in his world that nobody else cared to see. He saw people who were considered unclean, who were afflicted and were sick and were therefore um, considered that they had probably done something wrong or maybe someone in their life that they deserved what they were going through. These are things that he saw, that he noticed. When he came upon a person who, was, who had leprosy, he would touch them. That is unheard of. When he healed someone who was, who was blind or deaf, he would, he would put his hands on them as well. And when he did that, it's, it's sort of the sense that we can easily read over. But in that culture, when someone had an affliction, it was like, oh, you don't touch them. That could, that could make the jump to you. He would if, affirm their humanity. He would come to them. He would put their hands on them. He would see them. I think a lot of these people, the reason they followed Jesus and, and wanted, would, were willing to give up whatever it took to give up in order to follow him and uh, to take the stand, those, those who had interacted with him, I think they did it in large part because it was the first time they'd felt seen and understood by another human being, either in a long time or maybe in some cases ever. Even when it came to enemies of Israel, tax collectors, people just despised them and they felt that they had, they had cut themselves off from their own people. Jesus would look at them, he would speak with them, he would eat with them something no one else was willing to do. They called him the friend of sinners. They called him a friend of sinners because that's what he was. He would spend time reaching out to people who, who maybe didn't want anything to do with the current religious system, but he would go after them. He would pursue them. And so Jesus loved lost people. Lost people loved him. Do I see the lost. I'm going to show you a video. We've got videos uh, for this series of people from our church. Last week we looked at one uh, where, where Gary shared about how someone had reached out to him and drawn him toward faith in Jesus. This is a story about someone who had a sort of a chance encounter 
And she was willing to speak up in that moment. I know our, our, um, the brightness might be a little down, but bear with us. We're dealing with a little bit of a technical difficulty. But check out this story, really, uh, and listen to what Valerie has to say to us this morning. So it was a Saturday morning, and I was meeting a couple of gentlemen for breakfast at a restaurant in Ipsy called The Bomber. And we were all involved in children's ministry. And so we were just meeting for breakfast, having a brainstorming session. And as we were finishing up, um, and starting to walk away, there was a gentleman at the table next to us who leaned over and said, are you with the church? I said, yes, yes we are. And he said, I've been thinking about God a lot lately. One thing he said, I've noticed that in 12 self programs, they all refer to a higher power. They all refer to God. Um, and that was my in. I knew where, where to go with that. And so I said, do you know why? all those 12 programs talk about a higher being in God. And he said, no. And I just said, because those problems are too hard to overcome without God. And then we just talked about our church for a little bit, gave him the Facebook page that had sermons on there. Um, and one thing before I left, I told him was, you know, God is definitely calling you. Find a church to go to and don't give up. There's so much out there and available don't get frustrated and give up. God's calling you for a reason. And as I was driving home, there were a couple things that crossed my mind. Uh, one was, you know, at that point, I really wasn't comfortable praying in public like that and, and talking about um, church stuff in public. Um, but what I learned was it doesn't matter. You know, even if you're in a crowded place where most of the people there are going to think a negative thing about you for praying, there might always be that one person who needs to hear that God is real. The other thing I started thinking about was the conversation I'd had with uh, my two fellow ministry leaders, and I was hoping that it was a positive conversation, but it did make me stop and realize when I'm out in public, I am an ambassador for God and for Christ. And so if I'm gonna talk about Christ, I'm gonna pray, make sure whatever I'm saying is uplifting and is positive. But it was an awesome experience. It really affected me and made me rethink about being a Christian out in public in everyday life. Well, thanks to Valerie for sharing that story of a, a simple interaction, really, that just happened while she was out with some people. And, and I love it because it, this opportunity is around us all the time. And it's sort of just an everyday type of scenario, and yet it's there, it's sitting there, that opportunity is sitting there waiting for us. And the question is, do we see the loss? Do we even see the opportunities as they come our way? Jesus carries on in verse 36, the second half of that, it says he had compassion on them. So when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. One thing that we see that's really clear through his interactions with people who are far from God, through his heart here in this moment, that he loves those who are far from God. He loves the lost. And the question we need to ask ourselves is, do I, like Jesus, do I love the lost? Do I love the lost? And I think this is a tough question today. Here, here's why. Because in our culture, this cultural climate is leaning more toward insults and division between people who disagree. And our rhetoric gets kind of, it just, it gets sort of muddled. And even sometimes it's not, it may not be direct. Sometimes it's indirect. Sometimes it's what we're posting and we're th putting it out there as something for you know, as an ideology, but it's very clearly aggressive towards other people, and they'll be feeling some sort of passive, aggressive tone as they read it, and it just is turned into that sort of culture uh, in our world that we just seem to be divided, as divided as we've ever been in a lot of different ways, and uh, sometimes Christians get in on that fight, and it's not the right fight. It's not the right battle. Uh, most of the time, these, these issues that we're, we're deciding that we, this is the one I'm going to speak up for is not the right battle. And it actually can oftentimes be turning off the ability to have the right discussion about the gospel. Uh, there's a book that I've quoted here many times um, by Elliot Clark called Evangelism as Exiles. And this is written by a missionary who is spending time in Central Asia, Muslim nations. And uh, he doesn't name the specific nation, but he, he was spending time in a Muslim culture. And 
with the goal of sharing the gospel. And so he knows a lot about sort of being in a culture where you feel like a stranger, where you feel like an exile, and you're, you sort of, in a sense, feel far from home. And he's then come transitioned back to living in the United States, and he's like, there's some characteristics that are starting to carry over because there are changes happening in our culture um, and where suddenly sometimes Christ, as Christians we look around and we go, oh, I thought that this major, was the majority opinion, but it doesn't feel that way anymore. And uh, so now, how do we handle that? How do we handle some of these points where we feel like we're wrestling or we're in a tension? And he gives some just amazing thoughts out of that, uh, uh, out of First Peter, about how we should handle ourselves in these circumstances. And as it relates to this idea of the cultural rhetoric and the and the and sort of the climate that we're living in now, um, he has some really great thoughts in the, in the chapter three, which is entitled "With Respect for All," um, from where he's referring to some some talks out of First Peter. Um, but it, he, it, it, the section I want to read to you just um, builds. On that, he says, the American cultural proclivity to reject authority and put down opponents has bled into the church, staining all our attempts to win a hearing for the gospel. So, if we truly desire an open door for evangelism, we in the church can't be those who sling mud on political rivals and throw shade on their followers. We can't succumb to the rancor of the 24 7 news cycle. Perhaps most important of all, we can't dishonor our opponents by dehumanizing them. And we just need to be careful about how we, how we carry ourselves in the public square, how those discussions go, what the tone of those discussions sounds like. And he goes on later, he says, you have to, you, essentially, you have to pick your battles. Uh, because if the dominant message is constant displeasure or disagreement, we lose our audience, our endless social commentary and political engagement can be off-putting, he says. We want to not lose our audience for the most, before we get to the most important message of all. And so he's making the case that in some circumstances, and it's not that we don't stand up for justice or we don't stand up for what's true or we don't stand up for, for what's right. We do those things. But in some circumstances, we remain silent on an issue in a certain, in a certain situation because of the sake of the gospel, having that opportunity and maintaining that opportunity to, to speak the gospel and to speak Jesus, as we just sung, with people around us. We have the tendency to draw battle lines around less than essential topics. And that's hurting our witness and, give, and preventing us from getting a hearing for the most important message, the most important good news we have of all time. Here's how Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, he says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Sometimes we're making enemies out of the people, the very people we are called to love. So we just need to be careful with how we handle ourselves in the public square and how we approach people with whom we disagree. If it, if it becomes this, this negative tone, if we, um, if we begin to dehumanize people that we're, that we're disagreeing with, we lose our opportunity to have a witness for the good news of Jesus. And Jesus' number one characteristic that he showed towards people who are far from God was that he loved them. He always spoke truth, right? Jesus always spoke truth. He always called things what they were. It wasn't that he held back and was weak in those areas, but particularly with those who felt ostracized by culture, those who felt put, put aside, cast aside by the religious elites, those were the people he approached with arms wide open, with a great dose of love to start that conversation. And people who were far from God loved Jesus, and he loved them. That's a pretty cool thing to see in his life and ministry. All right, he carries on in our verse. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Verse 37, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. The question is, do I believe God can find the lost? And even add a layer to that. Do I believe that God can find the lost and use me in that process? Again, that chicken little syndrome has driven us away as if the harvest is not plentiful. The harvest is, is, is uh, very rare, that we don't see um, a, a lot of, of plentiful harvest, but that, and that the workers maybe are many, um, but there's not a lot for me to do out there in the world. But it's exactly the opposite. I think our, this verse is just as true now as it was in the day that Jesus spoke it. The harvest is still plentiful, and the workers are still few. And um, we need to ask ourselves that question. Do I believe that God 
can find the lost and that he can use me in that process. We're hearing a lot about how the United States is slipping away from faith. In fact, it was, my brother sent an article out in our family thread this week. Um, it was on Yahoo in news. It was called, the, the article was called, Does God Exist? Only half of Americans say, without a doubt, yes. That was, that was how it was titled. And then we all like, started reading the article, and then the conversation started changing a little bit. Because one of the things that we see, we, we live in a culture right now, like it's immediate. It's like you scroll through and you see headlines. And so they want to grab you with headlines, right? They want to grab you with headlines. And so a lot of times these headlines are extreme. So even with this particular article, as you opened it and then you started to read it, it also said in the article that only 7% of Americans do not believe in the existence of God. So it's kind of like the opposite of what the title is suggesting, right? It's like, oh, only half of Americans say definitely yes. Basically, they did a survey where they asked a sample of people like, have you ever doubted, for, even for a second, the existence of God? And every honest person was like, yeah, you know, maybe once when I was whatever. And, and, and then they're like, check it out. They kind of twisted that stat around to be like, look, no one in America believes in God anymore, basically. And then you read the articles like, that's not true. That's not what it's even, that's not what the research even says. But there's sort of sensationalized this, this article. But here's the thing. Here's the danger of it. In our world, we scroll through, we see the headline, that's it. We accept that as truth. And we don't, we don't look deeper and we don't see what's really going on. And that can actually impact and influence the society in a negative way because people are like, oh, I'm, I'm the weirdo? You know, maybe I should question all of my beliefs. And, you know, if someone's even a nominal uh, believer, like that can have an impact on where they're coming from. And it's sort of giving us that chicken little complex. It's not even just out there in the world or in, in mainstream media that this is happening. It's happening, honestly, unintentionally, it's happening inside the church. And I've, I mean, I'll be, to be honest, I've probably shared some stuff that's like, okay, that's making this, the situation sound more bleak than we really should make it sound. Because it's being constantly pounded in to us. And we need to understand that, yes, there are some trends that are, that are alarming. There are some trends we need to be aware of. But the sky is not falling. God is still God. Jesus is still on the throne. He's still able to save. And that's where we need to, that's where we need to live. Now we see a whole bunch of statistics that actually support all of those things when you actually take a closer, closer look. Um, and we've d- drawn a lot of myths out of some of the statistics that we have seen that's out there. Um, a few things that, that I want us to talk about. There's this book by Rick Richardson. I referred to it last week. Um, and the book is called You Found Me. It's a, it, uh, subtitled New Research on How Unchurched Nuns. Uh, nuns are like N-O-N-E-S, like people who say, uh, I have no religious affiliation. They call, the, they call that group nuns. Millennials and irreligious are surprisingly open to Christian faith. So new research on how unchurched nuns, millennials, and the irreligious are surprisingly open to Christian faith. You Found Me uh, by Rick Richardson. It's a good book, um, and, it, and it gives us a little bit more of a positive picture of what's going on in our landscape using real data and real figures, and then what our opportunities are and what that looks like, how we can go out as ambassadors for Christ and make statements that will help draw people closer into relationship with Jesus. We do see as, as, as sort of part of the part that's legitimate, an aspect of this that's legitimate, we are seeing an increased percentage of unchurched Americans. In other words, people who are not participating in church in any way. Um, back in like 2016, that number was at 45%, but we were seeing a trend where it was rising by about a percent every year. So that, that is an alarm. That's something to be aware of. That's something to, be, to, to uh, understand and to know. Uh, and yet... Even though this is a trend that we need to be um, keeping our eye on, it also is a trend that's been abused and been a bit bit overstated because the fact of the matter is still that 71% of Americans, including 56% of those who are considered unchurched, who don't belong to a a local church or anything like that, um, they identify as Christian. 71% of Americans at large, 56% of unchurched Americans still identify at some level as Christ followers. 
So yes, there is this sense in which the percentages were losing ground, but as you dive deeper into the data, it becomes clear that that percentage of lost ground is primarily among what we would call nominal Christians, people who are not really living out faith in a meaningful way even to begin with. And so then they're losing, they're beginning to drop the label, which in some aspects and some elements makes it easier to know who to share our faith with and who, who is, um, you know, it, it sort of draws those lines out a little bit more simply. So in addition to that, there are more people who are open to hearing the gospel than you think. In fact, 79% of unchurched people said that they're okay with it. They either strongly agree or agree to the idea that a friend who values their faith might want to talk to them about it. Like, are are you okay with that? Um, uh, And and 79% say yes. So let me tell you exactly how that question was worded. It says, if a friend of mine really values their faith, I don't mind them talking about it. 79% say, yeah, I at least somewhat or, or strongly agree with that statement. So that's a, that's a pretty open field of people who are willing to hear us as long as they know that it's important to us. And that's sort of an assumption, right? Last week we talked about Christ's love. His love compels us. So if his love is compelling us, this is something we care deeply about. And if that's the case, those 79% of people are, are fine with hearing about that. But yet the reality is 71% haven't, had, haven't been shared with They have not had a friend one-on-one share with them about their faith in Jesus. So there's a gap there. 79% who are willing uh, and 71%, so only 8%, have actually received that message and heard that from somebody else about how to become a Christian. So there's a few things that they do want as we approach them. They want someone who will, one, listen without judgment. They want, number two, they 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 want to be able to draw their own conclusions from the conversation. And number three, they want to be talking with a conversation partner who's confident in what they're sharing. So, do I believe God can find the lost? There's still, there's still a lot of openness out there. And I think we've been inundated with stats and with, with data and with a message that there's no openness anymore in, 20, in the 2020s. There's zero openness, and that's just flat out not true. There's more openness than we realize. There's more people willing to hear the message of salvation about Jesus Christ than we realize. And when we ask this question, do I believe that God can find the lost and that he can use me in the process? It's ultimately a a question about trust in God. Not trust in ourselves, not trust in what the current trends of our society is. But do we trust in God that he is still at work in our world? I think that answer is a resounding yes. And we need to find that confidence and realize that the sky's not falling. We don't need to go either to extremes or complete inaction. We can, t- we can still share our faith the way that we were called to share our faith, winsomely and in love, with grace and with truth. Amen. Matthew chapter 9, verse 38. He continues on, The harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. And then he says, Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So he's telling his followers to pray. So the question, I'm I'm going to pull two questions from this portion. Question number four for us this morning, do I pray for the lost? Do I pray for the lost? In a couple of weeks, we're going to discuss the the blessed practices. Um, If you... Did I lose my little? No, there it is. If you were here last week, you received one of these little cards. We call this a top three card. If you missed it, if you were not here or you lost it or whatever, we've got a bunch of them. We, we printed hundreds of them and we're going to continue to print them uh, because we want to keep these around. This is not a just for this series sort of thing. This is something we want to be part of the DNA of our church, something that's what we're all about. Just having people that we're trying to be intentional with, not turning them into projects, but just people we're being intentional about sharing the best news ever with. And these are, the, these are our top three cards. On the front side, we list our top three. On the back side, it says, I commit to intentionally loving my top three by utilizing the blessed practices. We're going to talk about what those look like in, in the coming weeks. Next week is our student takeover, and we're going to jump back into this series. And that very first, um, very, very first step of the blessed practices, the first uh, letter B in the acronym, is to begin with prayer. To begin with prayer. Do I pray for the lost is the question, and it really relates with the, uh, the idea of these blessed practices. We're going to talk a little bit more about that, uh, like I said, in the coming weeks, but Jesus actually asks his followers here to pray that people would go out to the lost. Are we praying similar things? Are we praying for the lost? Are we praying for people to reach the lost? 
Here in our church, we did a, a survey, a congregational survey earlier in the year. Many of you participated in that. And according to the survey, about two-thirds of us, or 65.7% to be exact, have at least a top one when it relates to this top three card. We at least have one person who we uh, are, are aware of. We didn't ask about three. We asked about one. So that's, all, that's the data we have for that. And that's pretty good. About two-thirds of us have a top one or more. Um, that's pretty good. The, the next question, or a couple questions down, was um, did, did you actually share the gospel with someone in the past 12 months? About a third of us, 29.9%, have actually shared the gospel in the last year. Also, by church like standards across the nation, that's pretty good. But it also gives us a challenge point, you know, just personally for ourselves, even for myself, absolutely as well. Just how frequently are we willing or seeking out opportunities to share the greatest news ever with someone who we care about in our lives? And are we praying for those opportunities to come up? One of the things, and, and we'll get to this, we'll talk about this a little bit more in a second, but one of the things we're going to do with this series is each week, we're challenging you to come up with an I will statement, an I will statement, something that you will put into action over the course of the next week, in this case, the next two weeks, an I will statement saying, this is what I'm going to do to put this, to put this message, to put what Jesus is calling us toward into action. And um, a, a good I will statement might be to say, I'm going to pray for, for people who are far from God every single day. Or I'm going to pray for my top three. I'm going to start praying for them every single day this week. Or just asking God, show me opportunity. Show me a place where I can speak up in a, in a loving and winsome way to the people around me. Do I pray for the lost? Do I pray for opportunities? Do I pray that people will go to them? And then the fifth and the final question that I'm going to ask this morning out of this passage, out of the same verse, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. The fifth question is, do I go to the lost? Do I go to the lost? Like, once again, 29.9% of us say in the last 12 months, we've had an experience where we've done that. Um, so 70% of us have not in the past 12 months. And even those of us who say that we have, if you're like me, you're probably like, but I need to be more intentional. I need to be more intentional. If this is the best news ever, and there are people who are, I'm around who I love, who I care about, who I interact with, and sometimes strangers who I don't know, but who need this news, then I've got to be willing to share it. What I love about this passage in Matthew chapter 9 is Jesus kind of pulls a fast one on them. Okay, he's like, hey, um, followers, come over here. Let me show you these, these crowds of people, see my compassion for them. Let's pray that God will send out harvesters into the field, you know, that he will send out workers into his field because the harvest is plentiful. And um, then he goes, did you pray? Awesome. He's answering it. You're the harvesters. Go. Because chapter 10, he sends out the 12 to go on a mission trip. Like he pairs them up and he's like, go out to the towns, go proclaim the good news. Like that's what he does. He's like, did you pray? Awesome. You're the answer. Let's go. And so they're like, what are they supposed to say at that point? You know, he, he's just asked them to pray that God would raise up workers to send into his harvest field. And then they did. And he tells them that they are those workers. And that's what he's doing, I think, for each of us, for all of us right now, is that he is saying we are the workers that he wants to send into his harvest field. And that's why he's put us wherever he's put us in our lives. There are people around us who need to hear the gospel. So the fact that he says that you're the answer to his followers and then sends them out, that's not a unique thing to that day and age. We're the answer as well for our world today. He doesn't have a plan B. He sends out his people to, to pursue and to chase after those who have not heard the message of Jesus Christ. And that message is that he came, that he, he died for our sins so that we could have a relationship with God. And it's through him that we can have relationship with God. We have broken fellowship with the Lord. There's brokenness in our world, is there not? I mean, I think every single person agrees with that statement. As we look around in our world, as we read the news titles, as we, as we experience uh, just our daily lives, we understand that there's brokenness in the world. There's something that feels like it's not right. And that's always been like that. It's always been like that ever since the fall. But God created us for something more, and he had lost something. He wants it back, and he pursued us to the point of giving his life on the cross so that we could have relationship with him. It's the best news ever, that once we were dead in our sins and transgressions, but God, because he was rich in mercy, gave up his son so that we could have relationship with him. 
And I think that the best strategy throughout history for sharing the good news, for sharing the gospel, the best strategy from day one has been to share it from person to person, individual to individual. I mentioned this last week, but there's a book on evangelism in the first century by Michael Green, and he he estimates around 80% or more of the evangelism that took place in the first century that allowed the church to burst onto the scene is really the reason why we're still meeting here today. That 80% of that evangelism was done just by normal Christians, just by average, ordinary Christians explaining their lives to people around them. So explaining what's happened, what's gone on in their lives. And it gives us the opportunity to do the very same thing in our world. So I want to challenge you with that I will statement. I don't know what it might be. Maybe you need to identify your top three. We don't want to micromanage what your I will statement is. We want you to listen for God to speak something to you. What will your I will statement be? And then write it down and then hold yourself to it. Maybe in your life group you could share about it. Maybe there's an accountability partner you want to have, whether it's a friend or someone from your group or a spouse or whomever, and, uh, and hold one another accountable to following through on those I will statements. So seek to identify a top three. Maybe it's something about prayer. Maybe it's learning your neighbor's names. Maybe it's seeking out an opportunity to pray. I don't know what that might look like, but hopefully... It's something that God lays on your heart. Do I see the lost? Do I love the lost? Do I believe that God can find the lost and use me in the process? Do I pray for the lost? And do I go to the lost? Let's pray. Uh, Lord, we thank you that you are at work in our world. We thank you that you want to use your people. We thank you that you care enough about your creation that you will pursue us at great cost to yourself to draw us back to you. And Lord, this morning, I just pray that you would empower us to fulfill this vision that you had for the world. And it's your love, like we talked about last week, it's your love that compels us to share that with other people around us. And God, there's a a million reasons why we sometimes are uh, nervous or why we freeze up, why we don't share. And you are aware of all of those. And you're patient with us. But God, just give us a burden and a love for people that goes beyond discomfort for ourselves. God, help us to care deeply about the hearts of those who are far from you. And we pray that you empower us Lord, thanks for your word. Jesus, thanks for being one who came to us as as a sent one from God and then for sending us on your mission. We love you and we trust you. We pray that you would use us in our world. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, thank you all for being here this morning. We are going to have a prayer team up front. If you want to talk about anything you heard this morning or something that's going on in your life, it would make their day to be able to pray for you this morning. So don't hesitate to come on down. We will see you all next week as as we uh, have our student takeover weekend. You don't want to miss that. We'll see you then. Thanks. Stars through the very breath I breathe. There's no end to.